Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you once more that we all made it here safely, and we pray that through your Spirit we may understand not only the plan of salvation for ourselves, but that we may help somebody else understand. Bless us as we open our minds and hearts to you. May we really hear your voice. We don't want to know what churches teach, what men teach, and not even what is the latest hobby. We want to know what your will is for us, that we may do it. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We've covered some ground in the last few sessions. I think we should take just a moment to review, to uh, be sure that we're staying together here. The first scripture that we looked at was Hebrews 10.5. A body hast thou prepared me. That, to me, has always been an interesting scripture. Way back when I didn't understand anything, that scripture intrigued me. I wonder, why does it say that? A body has not prepared me. Who prepared it? The Father. Well, to us, that makes a whole bunch of sense because we know there is a Father. <laughs> But what does the Trinitarian get out of that scripture? What can they make out of that? A body thou hast prepared me. It's obviously Jesus talking. Who would be somebody else that could prepare God the Son, as they say? A body. The only one who could say that is the Son of God. And that's what Jesus is, the Son of God. But back in those days, I didn't understand these things. And so it intrigued me. A body. Now, what kind of a body would that be? A human body. Why did God have to prepare Jesus a special body? There are lots of humans around who don't have a special body. Why couldn't he just have a regular human body? Because that's what a lot of people think Jesus had was a regular human body. But, of course, it wasn't a regular human body because this is God prepared a special one for him. Well, we're not going to go all the way back there. I just want to remind you, we raised the question. Why did God have to prepare Jesus a special body? Without going back through all that, it was because Jesus was going to go through something that no other human would ever go through. Okay? I'll let you run with that. Now, that was the first scripture we looked at. Now, when he got that body, that body wasn't really him. Who was the real him? The divine Son of God. Now that's something else people don't think about. He needed a special body because that body was not him. The him was the divine Son of God who had that body. So he had two natures. Okay, those two natures became the person we know as Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Jesus was not anointed the Messiah as the divine Son of God. He was anointed the Messiah as the human. Okay? And whatever the human did, the divine Son of God also did because he laid aside all of his God powers for himself. He wouldn't use them. So he just went wherever the man went and did whatever the man did. Okay? So all these things are hiding in the Incarnation. But they're all real and they're all there and we can't let these things go by and pretend they don't matter because all of them matter because Ellen White told us his humanity was is everything to us. Well, if it's everything, it sounds to me like that's important. <laughs> okay. So his humanity, the kind of a human he is that had a body prepared by his father for him special, Jesus came to this earth 
and took the disguise of a man. And I know people jump up and down the second you say that and say, that's not true. The Bible doesn't say that. Yes, it does. And so does Ellen White. Okay? In CTR 227, she says, that under that disguise of a man was the reality, the divine Son of God. See? There it is. Now, I just gave you a page for those people who are listening and don't like to hear some of these things. It's all right. We all have a right to our opinion. But that opinion doesn't count in salvation. We better have the opinion that God has. And he has given us his words. All right. Now, that's not the only word that Ellen White uses. She uses the word guys. We all know what that is. She uses the word garb. The garb of humanity, he clothed himself with humanity. The humanity was not himself. The humanity was what he put on himself. Now, he was a real human. That was a real man. Jesus was a real human, a real man, but not like the rest of us. And we better start saying that. We better start understanding there's something very special about Jesus. He was holy, <laughs> pure, undefiled, harmless. And you make your own list, okay? And that's the way he always was. So he says in verse uh, 7 of Hebrews 10, Lo, I come. Why do you suppose he came? I come. Do you think he came to show us how a struggling sinner lives trying not to sin? Is that why he came? There's not a word like that in the Bible anywhere or the Spirit of Prophecy. The Bible says, and the Spirit of Prophecy says it over and over, Lo, I come to do thy will. <laughs> That's what he came to do. No struggle. No propensity, no bent. I've come to do thy will. That's what I'm here for. And he said, my God. Does Jesus have a God? What Trinitarian can say that? It's an impossible statement to a Trinitarian, but it's in the Bible. And Jesus also said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, abandoned me, left me all by myself. My God, he says, Jesus has a God. It's his Father. <laughs> now, in Desire of Ages 535, does your brain tell you anything about that page number? It's after 5.30, isn't it? Now, the people today who are teachers, all the way from the top down to the lowest teacher among us, and the ministers also all say that Ellen White changed her mind after page 5.30. She was a Trinitarian. That's what they all teach. And for some reason, they all just sit there nodding their head yes, and nobody thinks for one moment, well, if she changed, then she has to stop calling Jesus the Son of God, the Divine Son of God. Because the Trinitarian doesn't believe in the Divine Son of God. They believe He's God, the Son, which is entirely different. So page 535 is five pages after She's supposed to have become a Trinitarian, and now she doesn't say Son of God anymore. So let's see what page 535 says. Calmly, Christ stands before the tomb. Whose tomb? Lazarus. This whole chapter is about Lazarus. A sacred solemnity rests upon all present. Christ steps closer to the sepulcher, lifting his eyes to heaven. Did you notice how Jesus prays? Father, none of this burying your face in the ground stuff. 
Father. <laughs> okay. Christ steps across his sepulchre, lifting his eyes to heaven. He says, Father, I thank thee. Thou hast heard me. Not long before this, Christ's enemies had accused him of blasphemy and had taken up stones to cast at him because he claimed to be the Son of God. What did she say? Come on now, Ellen White, you're not supposed to say this. They accused him of performing miracles by the power of Satan, but here Christ claims God as his Father. And with perfect confidence declares, he is the Son of God. <laughs> now, I think one of the reasons scholars are kind of quiet on this page is because Ellen White didn't make it up. She's taking it from the Bible. This is what the Bible says. If you're going to change Ellen White, you have to change the Bible. <laughs> Do you remember on page 530, Jesus asked Martha who he was. She, he asked Mary and Martha. They both had the same idea. And the answer that he got was, Thou art the Son of God. That's after in Christ was life, original. That's on the same page, but it's afterwards. So the first Son of God that Ellen White uses is on the same page. Now, I'm just telling you something that you can check now. Every book you ever read that was written after page 530 of Desire of Ages, 1898, you check any of them. You read all the Review and Herald articles after 1898. You read all the signs of the times. You read the youth instructor. You read every article Ellen White ever read, wrote and had printed after 1898. And they all say, Son of God. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> So it can't possibly be true what the scholars are saying and what's being taught today. It can't be true. All right. As we go into this further now, when Jesus came, oh, I need one more thing on that page. There's something beautiful here. Christ desired all to know his relationship with his father. Jesus wanted everybody to know God is my father. Now, let's get to the good one. I thank thee thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe thou hast sent me. Where's that? That's John 17, 3. See? She's hitting all the big ones that disprove the Trinity. Continuing. Here, the disciples and the people were to be given the most convincing evidence in regard to the relationship existing between Christ and God. They're not the same person, see, between Christ and God. Have you ever had a relationship with yourself? <laughs> How can a person have a relationship with himself? I'm me. That's all there is to it. <laughs> but Jesus has a relationship with God, which proves God is not him. Continuing. They were to be shown that Christ's claim was not a deception. So Jesus is the Son of God. No matter what scholar says, no, he was just role-playing. They're the ones who are deceived because Jesus did not tell them a deception. He told them the truth. I am the Son of God. 
And the father says, yes, he's my son. I'm well pleased with him. See, the father said it three times. So, if a person wants to look at this and get over their biases and everything they've been told that's not in the Bible, they can see it very clearly in Desire of Ages on page 530 and page 535. Just like that. They don't need to do the whole library. Just read what you're looking at. So when Jesus came, it was no deception. How did he come? A little baby. A helpless baby. An unconscious baby. God! The Son of God! A helpless, specially prepared body baby. Unconscious! God! How can you, how can you do that? <laughs> how could he do that? <laughs> he knew that's what was going to happen. He said, I volunteer. Boom! He's asleep. God's asleep? Yeah, he's asleep. How do you make the move from Jesus, the commander of heaven, to that baby laying there? Absolutely helpless. And anybody could kill him that wanted to, except the father said, no way, it's not going to happen. The angels are right there. No angels are going to get, I mean, nobody's going to get past those angels. So here's Jesus now, the incarnate son of God. Well, we know that he was a baby. 2SP. Remember, we're just reviewing here. We've covered this ground, but I want you to understand where we've been so you realize how important it is that we understand the Incarnation. The first meeting we had, we talked about mystery. What's a mystery? It's something that God reveals to the saints. Okay? That's what a mystery is. And if a person doesn't know something, they better find out why, because God reveals it to his people who are studying and want to know his will, so they can do it. <laughs> All right, one, let's see, what do I want? 2SP. The blood of beasts could not satisfy the demands of God as an atoning sacrifice. For the transgression of his law, the life of a beast was of less value than the life of an offending sinner. So all those animals that were killed in the sacrificial system, they didn't have anything to do with the plan of salvation. Nothing. They were just representing something in the plan of salvation. But the animals themselves had nothing to do with salvation because they're not valuable enough. An animal, the most expensive animal in the world, couldn't pay for one man. Who would trade an animal for a man? See there? So, so an animal's not, not good enough. That's not going to work. It could be acceptable only to God as a, a figure of the offering of His Son. And I see I missed one here. I just let me get that. His son. Man could not atone for man. What did she just say? Man cannot atone for man. Even that specially prepared body, it was still a man. A man cannot atone for a man. Even a perfect man cannot atone. Let's look at this carefully. She says, His, the man's, sinful, fallen condition would constitute him an imperfect offering. So, a fallen human cannot atone. Impossible. There are some people that think of Jesus coming in the likeness of sinful flesh made of a fallen human. Well, then he wasn't a perfect offering, was he? She just said here, right here, 
a fallen human cannot atone. All right, let's continue. Uh, for that, an atoning sacrifice, it would be a less value than Adam before his fall. Now, she's bringing in Adam before his fall here. That's very interesting. God made man perfect and upright. And after his transgression, there could be no sacrifice acceptable to God for him. Who is him? Adam in what condition? Perfect and upright. She just said it here. Adam was created perfect and upright. And anything less than his condition before he fell could not atone for him. See there? Get the thoughts because she's going someplace with this. It's very important. Unless the offering made for Adam before he fell should be superior to man as he was in his state of perfection and innocency. God cannot accept an offering for fallen man unless that offering covers man before he fell and that offering was superior to unfallen man. Do you get it? Jesus had to come to this world. That little baby was superior to Adam before he fell. These are hard thoughts to get because you've never heard them in church. I know you've never heard them. But they're in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. So Jesus came, the Son of the Infinite God. Jesus gave up His abilities to use His God power voluntarily. He could still do it, but he, de he decided by shaking hands with the Father, I will never use my God abilities for myself. I must do everything like a man. Everything must be done as a man to show men how they can live. I will be a man, a real man living a man's life. And then I will die a man's death. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? That's what Jesus said in heaven before he came. I'm going to die. There isn't a theologian in the world that believes Jesus came here to die. They say it was a human that died. Well, that's not the real Jesus. The real Jesus is the one that took the form of a human. The guys. This is getting tough, isn't it? <laughs> that's because it's the real thing. All of this is in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. All right, continuing. So, we see then that helpless babe. He didn't stay a helpless babe. We start growing. The Bible says he grew in favor with God and man. In favor. In favor. That means this is a pretty interesting person. In favor with man and God. There's no sin in that. This is a child growing in favor with God. There's a pure, spotless human being. And the next time we see him, he's age 12. We don't get to hear about all the things his brothers and sisters did to him. Yeah, they didn't like him around the house too much because every time it came time for somebody to volunteer to sweep the floor, Jesus was there. And I said, you're making this look bad. Quit that. Cut it out. <laughs> Here, tie these two cats together. He had a tough time. But he was pure and holy. That's why he had a tough time with them. He he couldn't understand how they could be so wicked. They all lived in the same house. <laughs> but I won't get into all of that. That's another story we need to look at someday. The fact is, at age 12, we see him again. And where is he?
He's old enough to go to the temple now. Bar Mitzvah is happening. Age 12, 13, right in there, the Jews all started turning into men. Okay. So they took him to the temple. And he looked around. And he saw things he'd never seen before. He read them in the Bible, but he'd never seen them before. Here was a beautiful temple. Oh, white marble, gold, grapes. It was gorgeous. He saw the priests. He saw the sacrifices. He was watching carefully. And then it hit him. Those dead animals. That blood. The priests. That's got something to do with me. Me. I'm not just reading the Bible anymore. This, this, this has something to do with me. And the more he put it together, the more he realized who he was. For the first time in his life of 12 years, he realized who he was. And he has a decision to make. Am I going to do this? <laughs> or do I back away from this right now? <laughs> right here. <laughs> yeah, he had to make a decision. The Bible doesn't talk about that, but a 12-year-old decided to be our Savior. Yeah. He put it together and he said, that's me dying there. That's my blood. God's law has been transgressed. God is my Father. Oh, what a thing that must have been for him. God is my father. Here, everybody's been saying my whole life, nobody knows who your father is. I know who my father is. <laughs> oh, tremendous. God is my father. And we know the story. In three days, Mary and Joseph are wandering around. They can't find him. They say, oh no, somebody's going to kill him. And look what we did. But finally they come to this back to Jerusalem and they hear that sweet melodic voice talking. Nobody had a voice like him and he was asking questions and, and the, the the ministers were there scratching their heads wondering, What in the world where's he coming up with this stuff? <laughs> we don't teach that. He didn't get it from our schools. Where's it coming from? So they started asking him questions just to put him on the defensive, but he answered their questions. <laughs> and they said, oh, Isaiah, what? <laughs> Daniel, what? <laughs> I said, where's the good in this? <laughs> you know, we can turn him into a champion. We need him on our side. Let's get him into our schools. They knew he hadn't been in their schools. They said, let's get him over here. We'll make him part of the Sanhedrin, one of the big shots. Of course, that wasn't going to work. The father kept Jesus out of their schools for a reason. <laughs> so Jesus is 12 years old. He knows who he is now. And now another 18 years of a perfect human life. That is not what's being taught today. This was a perfect human sinless person for 30 years. And what's he doing? He is proving to the universe there was absolutely no reason for Adam to sin. He was in a perfect atmosphere. He was in Eden, there were only angels to have his company. Everything was absolutely clean and pure. There was no excuse. But here is Jesus in this awful, sinful world where everything is wrong and he doesn't sin for 30 years. He showed the universe there's no excuse for Adam sinning. That was his job for the first 30 years. And he did it. 
But what has that got to do with his relationship to sinners? You see, even, I almost said names, and I don't want to do that about some of the people who, who think, people think were pioneers, but they weren't pioneers, they were second generation. But there were, there were people who were confused who were teaching at the general conference on these issues. Because they thought Jesus became in the likeness of sinful flesh when he became a human, a baby. No, no. The appearance was there, but there's something that is much more necessary to be the likeness of fallen flesh. We'll get to that. We're not there yet. But the point is, for the first 30 years, Jesus is a pure, perfect human being. Why do I say the first 30 years? What happened after that? When he was age 30, we're told John the Baptist was busy. And God said, when my son comes to you, I'm going to give you a sign. You will see it. And John said, okay, I'm waiting. And one day he was out there talking and and he sensed it. He looked around. It says there's something happening here. Jesus is in the crowd. Yeah. The next day, he came out. And these cousins saw each other for the first time. <laughs> but John knew it instantly. He said, I have never seen a perfect holy man before. So Jesus at age 30 was a perfect holy man. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you he was like a sinner. No, he was not like a sinner. He was a perfect holy man. And so Jesus said, baptize me. And John said, how can I do that? I've never seen a perfect holy man before. I know what I need baptizing. <laughs> and Jesus said, no, no, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, in order that I can help human beings, I must now join the human race at their level. Now, I'm taking another step down. I'm coming down now, and I'm going to participate in their sin with them on the imputation level. I will receive their sin, but it won't be mine. I won't have anything to do with it, actually. It'll be their sin on me. So for three and a half years, that's what Jesus did. The, the sins of the human race were being laid upon him and he was relating now to life as a sinner relates, as a Christian. So he's going to show a human how to be an overcomer even though they're sinners. See? He will have their sin on him. But he is sinless. You have to keep that always. He is absolutely sinless. So the sins of the world are not his at this point. They're still, they still belong to the sinners. But they're laid on him so he can sense them. He can feel them. He can walk around in them. And he can relate to God with those sins laid on him. Now, this may be a little confusing to you because we have not talked about Gethsemane yet. But when we get to Gethsemane, that's where our sins were given to Jesus and they became His to pay for. It wasn't until Gethsemane. You haven't heard that one in church either. But that's in the books and it's in the Bible. This is all part of the incarnation, the true incarnation of Christ. Okay, so what we see here is Jesus at age 30 Becoming one with the transgressors. He's now going to walk as one of us. Although he is sinless, 
he will have our sins on him. Okay, and he will relate to everything on that level and to show us what a sinner must do to be a redeemed person and right with God. And the first thing he did was be baptized. See? That was the first step. Now he's one of us. 3SM. One thirty-five. We're going to look at one of the many statements she makes like this, and it was the first time I ever looked at one of these. I couldn't understand why she said it in just that way. And of course, whenever I talk to somebody who thought they knew something, you know, the elite educators, they always said the same thing. Well, she was just rounding the numbers out. But somehow that didn't work with me, and I just let it go. So I'm going to read it to you now. This, I think I'm going to read it to you. No, it didn't Didn't take. Sorry. Let me get it. 3SM135.5. Here we go. Our Savior took up the true relationship of a human being as the Son of God. Now, do you see what that sense is saying? Ellen White's not always easy to understand. She, she words things in such a way that she knows what she's saying, but unless we're following her mind, we're not quite sure what to do with it. Well, what she said here was, Jesus, it's showing us the real relationship of a true human being with God. In other words, a person is not a sinner. And now she says he's doing this not merely as a man, but as the Son of God in a human form, living the way we should be living. So let's, let's look at this again. Our Savior took up the true relationship of a human being as the Son of God. We are the sons and daughters of God. Who is we? It's the same people she called us. The Bible reveals to us every lesson the Father and the Son. Well, who understands the Father and Son? It's not every Seventh-day Adventist, obviously. So us is not members of the church. Us is the true people of God. You have to read Ellen Hart the way she's writing, not the way we'd like it to come out. So it says here, we are the sons and daughters of God. That's the real ones. In order to know how to behave ourselves, <laughs> the true children of God, in order to know how to behave ourselves circumspectly, we must follow where Christ leads the way. So Jesus lived the last three and a half years to show Christians how to live. For 30 years, what'd you say? For 30 years, he lived the life of a perfect man. <laughs> you thought I made it out, didn't you? <laughs> For 30 years, she says. Well, she meant 30 years. She didn't round out his whole life. She meant 30 years because it changed after the 30th year. Now, for three and a half years, he's going to live like sinful human beings who have become Christians now live. So there was a difference. His peaceful life was now over, she said. Okay, remember, we're just reviewing. We've talked about all of this. <laughs> you want to put it together and so you can handle it, so you can get it. So she says, for, the, for 30 years, he lived the life of a perfect man. I've never seen that quoted any place. Maybe somebody wrote it and I didn't see it. I'm sure there's lots of that. But I've never seen anybody quote that. 30 years, a perfect man. So after he identified himself with us at the baptism, he now says, now I'm going to live like the sinners need to live as Christians. What was the first thing he did? 
he went into the wilderness of temptation. He's first step, be tempted now, like Christians are tempted. <laughs> be tested. And that's how he began his ministry. Did you notice his ministry as the Messiah began after he was baptized? Because Daniel tells us he would be anointed when he was about 30 years old. <laughs> as the Messiah. So Jesus is now the Messiah. We won't talk about Gethsemane. We haven't touched it yet. We're going to spend some time on Gethsemane. And the cross. We've got to get to the cross. That's where the incarnation is headed. In the youth instructor, June 2nd, what's the year? 1898. Get this one and get this memorized. Because it's the one you're going to use over and over again. Youth instructor, June 2nd, 1898. What does it say? He began where the first Adam began. Okay? So Jesus began the whole thing where Adam began. And the question is, would Jesus fall or not fall like Adam? Would he, Adam fell? Jesus didn't fall. So for the first 30 years, he didn't fall. And now he's being tested as a Christian to see if Christians need to fall. And in three temptations, he proved Christians don't need to fall either after they're redeemed. Do you see that? There's lots of things we haven't talked about yet. AT-157, that's the one I told you last time. Let's get these down. AT-157, what's it say? You're going to need these. Because talking about the Father and Son is a wonderful thing to talk about. We need it as a foundation. But the Gospel is more than just knowing there's a, a Father and a Son. It's absolutely necessary that we know that. There is no gospel without the Father and Son. But there still has to be a gospel. <laughs> okay? So then, in AT 157, it says, Every lesson reveals the Father and the Son. So the gospel and the Father and the Son go together. You can't separate them. All right. I want to begin doing something now. I would like to go to 3SM. Let me get there. And I'm going to start reading now. And you can do your own reading in this section if you have not looked it up yet. In three selected messages, there is an entire chapter, a section on the Incarnation. And wonder of wonders. They have put beautiful parts of the quotations that say something. Yes. You can actually learn something about the Incarnation from this section. It's just not somebody trying to prove something. They inadvertently put together enough that you can see what Ellen White was really saying. <laughs> <laughs> so look at this. It's volume three, so selected messages starting on page 127. Read this carefully in your own books. Underline, cross-reference, do everything you need to to understand what this is saying because this is very important material and it's so important. I'm going to not wait for you to sit around and read it someday. We're going to look at it right now, and, for, and we're going to read the whole chapter to see what's in this chapter, so we can know that in some of our books, without people realizing what they did, they put something together that really is important. This is one of those places. Okay, just don't bother with the bold print, okay? The editors always mess that up. Just read what Alan White says. Okay. 
I'm going to start reading on page 127, and I'm not going to give you the pages. You read for yourself to find these things, okay? I'm starting on 127. He was to be like those who belonged to the human family and to the hu Jewish race. You mean the Japanese Seventh-day Adventist can no longer preach, or he was just like me. He looked like a Japanese. I'm sorry. That won't work. That Japanese person is a human and so is Jesus. But Jesus looked like a Jew. Does anybody want to fight me on that? It says here, he came to look like the Jewish race. His features were to be like those of other human beings. He had a nose, he had eyes, he had ears. Yeah, that's what she means. That's all I'm going to read there. He was to live a pure life on the earth to show that Satan had told a falsehood. Oh, Satan told a falsehood. <laughs> Does anybody here want to see that one? That Satan told a falsehood. <laughs> She's saying pure, straight, simple things. Jesus came looking like a Jew. And Satan told the falsehood. What else does he tell? He claimed that the human family belonged to him forever. The more we think about Christ becoming a baby on earth, the more wonderful it appears. How can it be that that helpless babe in Bethlehem's manger is still the divine Son of God? So when somebody tries to tell you differently, you know a page now where she says, that little baby is the divine Son of God. <laughs> and he didn't become the Son of God when he became a human. It's the divine Son of God. <laughs> You've heard people tell you these strange things. That the Son of God doesn't mean in heaven. You've heard them say that. Well, now you have a page to turn it around. Of course, there are hundreds of pages that say it, but... I'm giving you this page in particular in the Incarnation because she's linking it to when he became a human. He was still the Son, the Divine Son of God. All right, continuing. Looking upon Christ in the flesh, we look upon God in humanity. So, Jesus in human form. There he is. He's a human now, but that it's God there. It's not just a human. Christ has made an infinite sacrifice. Can a human make an infinite sacrifice? Not possible. Why? Because a human is a created being. Was Jesus, as a human, a created being? You don't seem so sure with that. Yes, he was a created being. The Father made him a body. See? You've got to get these thoughts straight. I will read it to you eventually where she says, He, as a man, is a created being with a nature less than the angels. I'll read it to you. I'm, I, I don't want you to believe anything because you hear me saying it. You either hear me give you a page or you go look it up. But I'm not going to tell you something I don't know is there. I can't afford it. You know what God would do to me if I started making things up? Well, I don't want to think about it. All right. He took upon his divine soul the result of the transgression of God's law. He took upon what? Sin, transgression, upon what? Not the human? It doesn't say the human being took the sins. To be just like us. It doesn't say that. It says he took upon his divine soul. Now that's something to think about. He fixed himself or he could do that. He took upon his divine soul the result of the transgression of God's law. Laying aside his royal crown, he condescended to step down step by step to the level of fallen humanity. And we're going to be looking at the steps. We're not done just because he became a baby. That wasn't steps. 
That was one step. Step by step for 30 years. That was one step. For three and a half years, that's another step. Becoming one with the transgressors, that's another step. Taking all our sins upon Him so that He owned them, that's another step. Paying for them, that's another step. Do you see the steps? That's what she's talking about here. Step by step. He kept going lower and lower and lower in his humanity to to get to where we are. <laughs> you may have to think about that one for a while. That's a tremendous statement. From the Jordan, Jesus was led into the wilderness of temptation. What happened at the Jordan? Baptism. Baptism when he was 30 years old. See, she says it in different ways. It's amazing what is sitting in these books. All right. Adam had failed on the point of appetite. And Christ must conquer here. Appetite. The power that rested upon him came directly from the Father. The power. His powers as God he couldn't use. It's like they weren't there. See? They were there, but he couldn't use them. He said he wouldn't use them, so that's the way it was. So the power that he had, and he had power, came directly from the Father. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> that's what God means for us to understand because he said that's the only way you can be a Christian is if you get the power directly from heaven when you get that power directly now you're in the plan of salvation he met and resisted the enemy in the strength here's the power here, here it is here's the power in the strength of a Thus saith the Lord. Don't ever say the. Don't ever tell anybody the Bible says. Don't tell them that. Don't ever tell them I read someplace. Don't ever tell them that. Don't tell them. Uh, I think I saw someplace. No, no. Oh, I heard. No. Give them a quotation, and if you don't have it on the tip of your finger, get it. Write it down a million times until you have it. And the next time somebody comes to you with that, you can say, over there in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, it says, would you like to read it with me? And you know what? They'll say, uh, you read it to me. Because they have no idea what it says. <laughs> but that gives you a chance to open your Bible or to quote it from memory so that the way you say it, the Spirit will say, yeah, well, that's what, what we wrote. <laughs> That's the scripture we use. We'll give it to them now. There's power in the Word of God. A power we don't know anything about. Thus saith the Lord. And then she says one of my favorite verses. Man shall not live by bread alone. But. And you know what I'm going to say next. The next line is taken out of every modern version. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. The devil hates that. Every word. This strength it is a privilege of all the tempted ones on earth to have. How do we know that for sure? All the tempted ones on earth? Because Jesus, the first thing he did was get tested. To see what he would do. And that's what he did. It is written. <laughs> it is written. That's our weapon. It is written. If you don't know what is written, you have nothing. You can't resist the devil just thinking, I don't want to do this. It can't be done. It is written. Young man, give your ways to the Lord and he will keep thee. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Christ was suffering as the members of the human family suffer under temptation. What does the word temptation mean? T 
test, but it will not. It was not the will of God. He should exercise his divine power on his own behalf. All right. Uh, Christ's innocence. He was innocent. He wasn't like us. He was innocent. Christ's innocence would have exempted him from all this anguish, but it was because of his innocence that he felt so keenly the assaults of Satan. All the suffering, which is the result of sin, was poured into the bosom of the sinless Son of God. See? So the sin is there. Our sin, but He is sinless. By the way, that was in the Youth Instructor, 1899, a year after Desire of Ages. <laughs> so she didn't change one little thing. Not one little thing. Uh, somebody asked her, well, Jesus was God, and you're telling us he was divine, and he was in that human form, and they got it. The people all knew what she was saying back then. Nobody hears it today, but they all heard Ellen White say it, and the pioneers. And somebody finally asked her, are you telling us that, that Jesus, the divine Son of God, in the form of a man, he could have been tempted? Wasn't he God? And they said, I will try to answer you. <laughs> As God, he could not be tempted. That's plain, isn't it? As God, he can't die. There's lots of things he can't do. As God. But now here's how she answers it. She says, as God, he could not be tempted. But as a man, he could be tempted. So then, if the man could be tested, which she says he was, and sorely tested, then where was God in the process of that man being tempted? He went wherever the man went. If the man had eaten bread, then God would have sinned. Can you understand that? The divine soul of Jesus would have become a sinner because the man would have been a sinner. Wherever the man went, Jesus, the divine Son of God, would have gone. That was the risk. That was the risk he took when he left heaven to take the form of a man. The man could have blown it! And that would have been the end of the divine Son of God. Now, is that a risk or is that a risk? I have never heard anybody talk about the risk in any kind of a meaningful term. They need to see this. He could have lost his eternal life as the divine Son of God if the man had done something wrong. His human nature must pass through the same test and trial Adam and Eve passed through. Are you ready? His Human nature was created. Did you think I made it up? You have a page now in your book at home, Three Selected Messages. Ellen White says, His human nature was created. So then, no, I'm not going to tell you the rest because people who hear you say uh, won't be able to handle it, and you won't be able to answer it, so I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> Just read what Ellen White says. The human nature of Christ was created. He's a creature as a man. Do you? No, I'm not going to raise that question either. Oh, I keep coming up with things that I've had to deal with historically, with philosophy and the rest of it. That the Lord has given me answers to, but it takes too long to get to it. I'm sorry. Let's stay with Ellen White for now. All I can tell you is the Bible and the Spirit prophecy agree 100%. And it has nothing to do with systematic theology. 
which was crammed down our throats as students at the seminary. That's right. And I have to tell you that almost 100% of them went away from that seminary thinking they are now systematic theologians, and that's a crime. You can't believe the true gospel of Jesus Christ as a systematic theologian. And that's got to fry a lot of ears. I'm sorry. Let's continue here. His human nature, that created human nature, did not even possess angelic powers. It was human, identical to ours. You mean Jesus had a human nature like mine in its weakness? Yes. What was the weakness? 4,000 years of heredity. That's weakness. Adam was way up there. We're down here except for Ken. We're down here. <laughs> we have weaknesses. Ooh, we get hungry. Boy, do we get hungry. <laughs> We get tired. We get thirsty. We have to sleep. We have, we, we have lots of weaknesses. Well, that's what Jesus took. He took those weaknesses. But no sin. No sin. He was a perfect man. Let's keep reading. A human body and a human mind were his. Oh, he had a human mind. That's really interesting. He did not operate with the mind of God. He operated with a human mind. And the divine Son of God let the human mind make all the decisions. That's another one for you to chew on for a while. We're covering a lot of ground. I don't think the people who wrote these things, I mean, put them in the, here as a compilation, realized all this information was here. They were just putting things together that sounded like incarnation. Well, they do more than sound like incarnation. There's tremendous information here. This is all inspired. This is the real stuff. All right, continuing. He was compassed with difficulties. He came into our world to struggle with sin? Is that what he came for? No. No. It says, He came into our world to maintain a pure, sinless character. <laughs> and to refute Satan's lie. Oh, here's another one. She said before he didn't tell the truth. Here's a lie. Here, here's Satan's lie. Jesus came to refute Satan's lie. What is it? That it was not possible for human beings to keep the law of God. That's Satan's lie. Jesus came to this world to prove Satan lied. Have you ever heard anybody else say that? That man can't keep God's law? Well, guess what you were listening to? And I don't care if you heard it from a pulpit. It's Satan's lie. She says it plain and clear. Satan's lie. Humans can't keep God's law. Did you ever believe that? I'm afraid you did because somebody told you in authority that you can't keep God's law. So just keep having faith. Now your faith that doesn't believe what God says isn't going to save you. They didn't tell you that. <laughs> they didn't tell you that. Because they don't know it. They have the wrong kind of faith. Continuing. Did you think the incarnation of Christ would tell you this much? <laughs> and we're not done. The incarnation of Jesus, His humanity is everything to us. We're starting to get it. Christ came to live the law in his human character in just the way in which all may live the law in human nature. Well, that doesn't leave anybody out. Every human being on this earth can live the law of God if they will do it the way Jesus did. 
Every human. I'm talking about that drunk in the gutter, that if they would become a Christian, they would receive the Spirit of Christ, and they can live the law the same way Jesus did. Yeah. He had inspired holy men of old to write. Do you need that one again? He had inspired the holy men to write. Who do, who do people say inspired the Bible? Every minister you talk to will tell you it was the Holy Spirit. And by Holy Spirit, they don't mean Jesus. They mean some ghost, some mystical floating thing around that nobody knows anything about that doesn't really even exist. But Ellen White just said it was Jesus who inspired the holy men of old because Jesus is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Abundant. Oh, I didn't read you what he said. He said, let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah 27, 5. All right. Abundant provision has been made. Abundant. Does that sound like enough? <laughs> Abundant provision has been made that finite, fallen man may so connect with God that through the same source by which Christ overcame in his human nature, he may stand firmly against every temptation as did Christ. Now, how many times does she have to say this before we understand it? Are we going to start getting this? We need all of us to get down and think about this and say, she said it. Jesus told her to say it. It's got to be true. If it's true, I want it. <laughs> What's it going to cost? Oh, now we've got something here. What's it going to cost? <laughs> because Jesus said no king when he goes into battle. Does, he doesn't go in there without counting the cost. He's got to know he can do it or he's not going to go. So we're told as Christians, count the cost. What's it going to cost you? It's going to cost you something. Figure out what it's going to cost and then you decide whether you really want to do this. Yeah. Because once you know the cost and you say, yeah, I know what the cost is, let's go. Then God says, all right, we have a winner here. Let's go. <laughs> this is beautiful. He breathes the air of the same world we breathe. He stood and traveled in the same world. And it, it was no more friendly to grace and righteousness than it is today. Now, I'm reading in this section that you can go home and study carefully because I want you to look for these things. They're there. They've been there all the time. And the church doesn't seem to know anything about these statements. They're there for the we, for the us. But to us, there's only one true God, the Father. Isn't that what the Bible says? That's, that's the us. And we all of us have to be part of the us. And John says, we know that he who is born of God does not commit sin. We, there's the we. We know us. There is somebody in the Bible who's us and we. <laughs> Let's get over there. And God says, I will show my mysteries to my saints. Well, let's get the mysteries. <laughs> It's a whole different Bible when you start reading it for yourself instead of what a church says. Yeah, read it the way God wants you to read it. Next, the higher attributes of His being, it is our privilege to have. Now, she said the higher attributes. She didn't even say His low down ones. <laughs> no, forget it. She said His higher attributes. It is our privilege to have. If we will, through the provisions He has made, appropriate these blessings and diligently cultivate the good in the place of the evil, we have reason 
conscience, memory, will, affections. That's what makes us human. See? That's what Jesus had. That's what made him human. He had reason, conscience, memory, will, and affection. Every facility was provided that human nature should come into union with his divine nature. So it takes all five of those things for us to understand what God is saying and doing and making our connection with him. It takes those five things. Jesus came here with those five things to show us how to use them. We may stand pure and holy and undefiled. That sounds familiar. (laughs) Christ did not possess the same sinful, corrupt, fallen disloyalty we possess, for then he could not be a perfect offering. Now you have it. That one sentence absolutely wipes out the idea he was just like us. So he was not like Adam before the fall. He had to be superior to Adam before the fall. And he was not like Adam after the fall or he wouldn't have been an offering at all. So we have seen Ellen White does not believe in Adam before the fall or Adam after the fall for Jesus. She doesn't believe it and he says the Bible. Somebody made it up. And I know who the somebody was and I can give you their pages also in their books. And I can tell you the people today who are teaching it. But we don't need to get into the error. We want to see the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and get to straighten our mind who we're going to believe. Do I believe Dr. So-and-so? Minister So-and-so? Educator So-and-so? Professor So-and-so? Or do I believe the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? We have to decide that. We're going to find lots of reasons later to make the right decision as we move through this. Okay, I think I'm going to end with that particular uh, quote. I'm going to read it again. That's on page 131. This is where we're going to pick it up next time. Christ did not possess the same sinful, corrupt, fallen disloyalty we possess. For then he could not be a perfect offering. All right, we uh, have a good start on this. We want to look at this section carefully because it's the launching pad into the next few places we need to go in the incarnation of Jesus. Father, we thank you that you had all this information put down for us. And it's just not information by itself. It is your spiritual knowledge. It's the truth. It's what we need to know in the true plan of salvation. We thank you that we didn't choose you. You chose us and you're teaching us now. We're so thankful that we have responded to you and we want to know your will. Bless us. Give us your grace that we may continue to hear your voice and to be lifted higher and higher until we sense what it means to behold him and become as he is. We thank you in Jesus' holy name.